Good to see some bright faces here this morning. Um, I want to head into a topic that's a, a big one. Um, give me one moment here. A feared topic, and that is a name, curiously, that uh, is from Latin, and it means a crab. The word that means crab in Latin is cancer. Why would it get that name? Well, when we think of a crab, what is it that's kind of about, uh, impressive about a crab? It's got these pinchers, right? And cancer, as it grows, puts out these tentacles, these uh, uh, chains of connective tissue that go into surrounding tissues and often pinch them and just keep growing without limit. If you were to define cancer, you could say that it is growth. And people tend to think of growth as wonderful. But growth that's out of control is terrible. Um, a few years ago, uh, cancer was always put in second place among the killing diseases after heart attacks, heart disease. Um, depending on who's doing the reporting, though, uh, because cancer has been increasing in incidence and heart disease, at least in some areas, has actually been going down, um, some reports say that it's actually the number one killer. <clears throat> well, this problem that makes cancer what it is, growth without control, division of cells, that just carries on and on and ends up displacing the normal organism and eating up the nutrition that should go to normal cells. Um, this kind of inordinate growth should make one think, is there anything in our life that would excessively stimulate growth? And you think about it, there actually is. What time in life does a human being multiply their size, their weight the most? In middle age. Yes, things expand in middle age often. Um, they're not going to get bigger in the sense of actually uh, getting taller, but yes, the middle expands. But there is a time in life when inevitably, if the person is taken care of properly, there will be tremendous growth. In infancy, absolutely. It's, not, it's true not just of humans, but of all animals. Uh, during those first few months is when a tremendous amount of growth occurs more than any time later in life. A baby, from the time it's born, till it's one year old, usually triples its weight. Um, now some of that is fat, and it's kind of pleasant to see the round faces uh, occur, but plenty of it is internal growth, growth of what are going to be the bones that start as cartilage. Um, during that time of tremendous growth, what supports that growth? after birth. What? Milk. Milk. You know, that should make us think for a minute. Milk is the support of tremendous growth. It's the stimulant of growth. Should it be taken in later life? When the main thing that's going to happen is you're going to have a chance of growing in a way that you don't want to. Um, and indeed, it's been shown in some cancers that very definitely the rate of cancer 
the frequency with which it develops is related to how much milk is drunk. And particularly one that I've seen that way is prostate cancer. Now, all of us, everyone here would be dead if it, from cancer if it weren't for the fact that we're continuously protected by a system that we usually don't think of. Uh, you know, everybody thinks at least once, twice, three times a day of one system in our body. You know, we make sure we get something into our belly. Uh, our digestive system, we're quite aware of. And if we get exercising enough, we often become aware of our heart and the circulatory system. But one system that most people do not think about, it doesn't usually impose itself on our consciousness, is the immune system. It quietly does its work all the time. Uh, when a person gets sick, the immune system, of course, really comes into prominence especially if there's an infection, those major members of the immune system, the white blood cells, do their work of killing, gobbling up bacteria and other microorganisms. Um, <clears throat> uh, we would, I said we would have died of cancer. We would have died of infections just as easily. The immune system is constantly monitoring our body. If there is any cell, anything that shouldn't be there, it's trained so that when it encounters something that is foreign, it attacks, and it attacks very effectively. The tricky part of cancer is that it's not really foreign cells. The cells that become cancerous are our own cells. And the white blood cells that make up the immune system were trained in infancy. They're a tremendous army, and they're trained in infancy. They go to military school in a gland that's situated behind our breastbone. It's called the thymus. Now, that's not the thyroid. The thyroid's up here in our neck. The thymus gland is well hidden uh, right in the chest behind the uh, sternum behind the breastbone. And <clears throat> during that time, all the white cells that are going to be teaching the other ones are in that military college being taught what are the different kinds of tissues in the body that it will encounter. Um, it's like an army that's being taught codes, secret military codes, so they'll recognize each other as being allies or right from the same country. So each of those white blood cells is taught, you never attack this lung cell. You never attack this, these joint cells, these stomach cells, brain cells, and so on. Um, generally, the job is well done. So as these white blood cells go through the body, monitoring what's going on, they are calm, peaceful. They don't start attacking what's on their list of of uh, accepted cells. But as soon as they encounter bacterium, it's not on the list, and they do it in. They, uh, they don't play around with foreigners. I couldn't be coming visiting Britain here if, if England were like our immune system, <laughs> even though my grandfather was English. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, the cancer cells, which also the attempt is to constantly monitor for any cell that becomes a rebel, it becomes a cancer cell, but it is a more difficult job because it's one of those cells that the white blood cell was taught to never attack. And the only way that it'll know that it's a cancer cell is if there is some telltale sign that shows up that there's a change, that it's not really a loyal body cell. And those telltale signs usually do appear. Like I said, we all would have died of cancer long ago if it weren't for the immune system constantly going around. As soon as they see any sign that this cell is not what it should be, bam. And uh, it, 
we could go into the process a little bit. What they call apoptosis is one thing. Another thing is like injecting into the cell uh, things that will just disrupt it and uh, finish it off. On the other hand, if the immune system, and I want to really emphasize this thing of the immune system, how it's protecting us all the time. If the immune system, for some reason, is not quite up to snuff, if it's not 100%, then the cancer cells may slip under the wire. They may not be recognized. And there is there's lots of uh, there are different things that can affect the immune system and hurt it. Um, in fact, if the immune system is acting haywire and attacking your own cells, which it shouldn't do, then they give drugs that dampen the immune system. When you do that, then you're making it also likely for the body to develop cancer because the immune system isn't acting at full speed. But I want to take a look at something much more common that affects the immune system of all of us. And that is um, the amount of sugar in the blood. The sugar in the blood, glucose, there has to be enough of it. You have to have a, a certain minimum amount because all the cells that are living in the body depend on glucose as their fuel. Uh, you don't have enough and the body can't run. So um, in the units you use here in Britain, that's uh, four or so, around four, maybe 3.5 uh, millimoles per liter. And then, as you go up, the upper limit that labs have, I haven't actually seen them here, but I would think they're around 5.5, maybe up to around 6. Now, that sugar in the bloodstream not only keeps all the cells alive uh, that are fixed in the different tissues of the body, it also keeps the bloodstream itself with its white blood cells functioning. It's interesting that the white blood cells depend totally on that sugar in the bloodstream for their energy. And you have to have enough of that glucose there. If there is excess glucose, it starts affecting those white blood cells. They become sluggish. Uh, you could compare it to a cat that somebody gets because he's got mice in the house and they want this cat to do the mousing job, kill the mice. If that cat is a bit hungry, he's going to do his job well. But if the person gives it rich dinners of meat, you know, just every day, twice a day, and the cat is just sleek and fat and as satisfied as can be, how much is he going to hunt the mice? So the same thing with the white blood cells. If you've got too much glucose in the bloodstream, they get lazy. Uh, I want to put up on the screen, there it is. I don't know if you can see it all. Uh, what this shows from an experiment that was done is the activity of the white blood cells according to how much sugar a person has taken in. Now at the beginning, at the top line there, we're saying the person is at a low but normal level. It's not below the normal lower limit. It's just at the lower lo uh, normal limit of blood sugar. And so those white blood cells are hungry. And this is all done in a time span of 30 minutes. Uh, perhaps this was done with an actual microscope watching these white blood cells. In 30 minutes, you go over to the middle, middle column at the top and you see 14 bacteria were destroyed by each white blood cell. There's a whole process they go through. They engulf the bacterium. Usually the bacteria are smaller than the white blood cells. And the white blood cells can change their shape. 
they go around it like they're giving a wonderful hug, and that hug is an eternal embrace. And uh, soon the bacterium is totally enclosed in the walls, in the membranes of the, of the white blood cell, and then the white blood cell pours in bleach, strong bleach. You know, bleach is a tremendous disinfectant, kills any living cells. So 14 of these bacteria are killed in half an hour. Now let's look over at the left column. It's telling us the number of teaspoons of sugar eaten at one time by an average adult. Now, of course, this is translated into what would be needed for the adult, but it's applied down at the microscopic level of the of the white blood cell and bacteria. If the person eats, has six teaspoons of sugar at one time, notice the number of bacteria that's destroyed in 30 minutes. Instead of 14, it's now 10. Over to the right, it's telling you how much ability the white blood cell has lost in its uh, killing of bacteria. It's lost 25% of its power. So, you know, if you've got a soldier there, who's lost 25% of his fighting ability, that's a significant decrease. Let's go to the next line. Next one is 12 teaspoons of sugar. And there, instead of 10, we're now down to the white blood cell being able to eat up five, on the average five and a half, bacteria in 30 minutes. Now you've lost, over on the right, you've lost 60% of your fighting power. Let's go further down, 18 uh, teaspoons of sugar. Now you're way down to two bacteria eaten up. You've lost 85% of your fighting power. And the bottom line there is 24 teaspoons of sugar. Now the white blood cell can only eat up one instead of when it was normal and in full power, it could eat 14. Just one bacterium in half an hour. You've lost over 90% of your fighting capacity. Now, someone would say 14 or... Certainly 24, who in the world would ever eat that amount of sugar? Well, uh, it actually does happen at times. We'll start with small amounts, like a chocolate bar. Chocolate bar has the equivalent of seven teaspoons of sugar, so you're down past that first level. You lost about 30% of your fighting capacity. <clears throat> um, ice cream. Half a cup, do people stay at half a cup? A scoop, a scoop. okay. <laughs> uh, that one is five to six, so you're at the first level of loss of power. Some people like to get sherbet. They think of it as more natural, uh, you know, not so much of the rich dairy. But sherbet is, if anything, is actually more, six to eight teaspoons of sugar. Um, a piece of apple pie, and at one piece, you'll take a pie to be this side, size, and you take, divide the pie up into sixths. Those are not huge pieces, they're just a good piece. And I don't know if every one of you limit yourself to just one piece. Um, one piece of pie is 15 teaspoons of sugar. Um, a banana split, do you all know, what, I don't know if you eat banana splits here. <laughs> banana split in U.S., Usually three mounds of ice cream and then dripping with chocolate that's poured over it and a banana that's cut in half on either side. One banana split has the equivalent of 25 teaspoons of sugar. So you've gone over your lower limit, below the lower <laughs> limit there. Um, <clears throat> I even experienced this myself one Christmas time at the hospital I was working at. Um, I uh, generally am not one who eats a whole lot of sweets. And I wasn't really fully into this program like I now understand it. And at around Christmas time, boy, at those nurses' stations, they have boxes of chocolates and other things. And I thought, well, I'll try one here. And then, you know, another 20 minutes later, <laughs> another one. I don't know how many I ate. I think it was the next day I came down with one of the worst flus I've ever had. Uh, doctors don't usually call in sick. I probably should have, but I could barely drag myself around the halls in, in the hospital. I hope I didn't give anyone a flu. <clears throat> I'm not sure that hospital foods are that exempt from this sugar problem either. I, I once saw 
a little cartoon of a man in the hospital bed sitting up with an angry look when they brought his dinner tray to, them, to him. And uh, he uh, spoke out saying, listen, is there any chance I can get back on IVs? <laughs> They say that the average U.S. citizen, the average American, eats about 42 teaspoons of sugar in a day. So these quantities that you see up there are not out of this world at all. They're, they're very practical. That, those 42 teaspoons, by the way, if we lived in what they call a primitive country, and I think of the primitive countries as living where the people live the way they should live, you know, they actually use their arms and legs and muscles to work in gardening and so on. Down in a place where they grow sugar cane. My wife is from Ecuador, and they grow lots of sugar cane there, and I enjoyed eating sugar cane. You can actually chew it. Maybe some of you know about this. And um, 42 teaspoons of sugar, you know what it corresponds to of length of cane that you're going to chew? 90 feet. <laughs> So you can see when we leave the simple foods the way God has made them, we become really outlandish. Now, each, each different kind of cancer, you could say, is really pretty near a different disease. Each of the different kinds of cancer are going to have different agents that come into play to cause it. Um, you know, if we were to ask you, what causes lung cancer? Everyone would say, smoking. And, you know, it's not that strange, the irritation of smoke. I mean, just, we get into a very smoky place, and it bothers us, you know, with seconds of breathing that stuff. Um, it's not a surprise that that kind of irritation, continuing for not days, but for years, does end up causing cancer. Um, <clears throat> And we could mention other kinds of cancer and the commonly known causative agents. But it's worthwhile to know a little bit beyond just what's commonly known. Anything else that causes lung cancer than smoke? Have any of you heard of asbestos? Uh, that's something of interest to me. I'm from Canada, and back in the 60s, the 50s, all the asbestos in the world was mined from Canada. I guess it's some strange substance that's not elsewhere. I remember when you had approached this area, I did uh, call portering, selling of religious, educational, and health books. And uh, in the journeys that I made in Quebec, uh, in rolling farm country, you suddenly ahead noticed this change in the landscape. It was kind of odd. You'd see a blank spot. And when you came close enough, you would see there was this tremendous... A hole doesn't describe it. It was a canyon that was incredible. It might have been a mile across or more. And it was, I'm going to guess, half a mile deep. And these trucks being loaded with asbestos, and then they would, they would crawl out on this uh, dugout, excavated pathway to make it to the uh, high land. Well, asbestos was found as time went on. Uh, first of all, in the miners to have increased the incidence of lung cancer. Uh, I'm mentioning this because it, it points out one important fact. The people that were miners of the asbestos had an increased risk of lung cancer, but an interesting thing is if the miner also smoked, what would happen? It, you have both of them increasing it. Um, ah, thanks. Uh, the rate of lung cancer of smokers compared to non-smokers, by the way, there are other things that can cause lung cancer than smoking. We mentioned asbestos, but there are others also. Even radiation in a basement of a house, just from radon that's there, can, in a few cases, cause lung cancer. But the risk is considered to be around 10 times. A smoker has about 10 times the rate of lung cancer. Let's, I don't have the figure for you, but let's say asbestos, an asbestos miner who doesn't smoke has an increased risk of, let's say, five times. And let's say the asbestos miner now is a smoker. 
You might expect we add those two together, 10 plus 5. But no, you multiply them together. 10 times 5 is the risk, 50 times the risk of lung cancer. When you go against a health rule in one area, and then you go against a health rule in another area, it's not just adding together against you, it's multiplying. Uh, there's a fancy term for this, it's synergistic. Things just really go together to the point where it, it makes bad things much more inevitable. I'm from the state of Kentucky now, originally Canadian, but uh, ended up in U.S. And uh, in Kentucky, it's a big tobacco farming state. A lot of people there, I don't know that whether their motivation is to get, get away from lung cancer, but a lot of people do not smoke the tobacco, but they chew it. And they, they seem to really enjoy it. You can see this brown junk around their mouth, and then every few seconds, and you, you see a wad of brown saliva come out. Um, and it is true, the person who chews, he is getting, taking down his risk of lung cancer. But you know, just yesterday in, in reviewing things for today, I saw a list of the cancers produced by uh, tobacco. Wow, it's like a dozen different kinds of cancer that are caused, including bladder cancer, esophageal cancer, that aren't even in the airways. Why does that happen? Well, you got quite a few bad things in the tobacco plant. I think the, the main use that tobacco has is what my grandmother used to do with it. She would take it and light the cigarette and sit it on the windowsill. I asked, what are you doing, Grandma? She says, it's to kill the flies. I don't know how well it did, but... <laughs> What's the most common cancer in human beings? No idea? What? Skin cancer. Skin cancer is number one. And if I asked you, what do we all hear is the cause of skin cancer? Sunlight. The poor son is blamed for all those cases. Um, right away, we should say, some people are rather protected from that effect of sunlight. Not totally. I am not protected. This skin is way too light. The darker your skin, the more protection God gave you. I, I, I can't believe that Adam and Eve were pale like I am. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, even if your skin is very black, don't be totally confident. You still need to pay attention. I, I saw an article once written about that, that uh, it's still worthwhile checking your skin. Um, now, since it's the most common type of cancer, you know, it's something we should think about. And uh, they've done studies about it. Uh, they've compared living in the tropics where you have loads of sunlight with living way in northern latitudes. Here we're not even far enough north. I think they were comparing it to Scandinavia. And where would you think that you get more skin cancer? In the tropical climate, and they do. They get more skin cancer. Um, where do you get more of all the other cancers, which are all internal? Pancre pancreatic cancer, stomach cancer, lung cancer, and so on. Where? In the northern climate. When you put it all together and just say, where do you have more cancer? And where is there more death from cancer? Who? The north wins out tremendously. So if you wanted to be safer from cancer, go and live in the tropics where you have the worry about sunlight. But another thing about this is, in cancer, the really big concern is an early diagnosis. You really want to catch it early if you're going to do something about it. And cancer, like pancreatic cancer, the person just is not aware of it. It can grow and grow. Finally, when it gets to such a size that it actually bothers other organs, or he might already have pain. You know, it's interesting. A lot of cancers don't give pain. 
That cancer has to be big enough to be causing pressure and, and major trouble. When it's finally at that state, the guy may go to see the doctor, and generally it's hopeless. You want an early diagnosis. What kind of cancer could you make the earliest diagnosis on? Well, there's one kind of cancer where it's growing there visible. If you can't see the part of your skin, you get, get someone else. If you're married, make sure your wife looks at everything. Um, if there were some wicked, uh, like in the stories of the Arabs, the Thousand and One Nights, some wicked genie that pops up in front of you and says, I have bad news for you. You've got cancer, but you have one choice about the cancer. You can choose the kind. What kind would you choose? Well, I would choose right away skin cancer. <clears throat> um, one thing that I, by the way, in skin cancer, it has been related, they've done close study of this, it's not just getting out in the sun. Getting sunlight, and someone like me tanning, like I've been trying to do, it's a little difficult here in Britain. I, I think of, they think of me as a little strange running in the park with all my shirts off and folding up my pants, but I did it a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, just getting a tan, just getting sunlight on the skin doesn't do it. It's a sunburn that is related to later cancer of the skin. Um, there was a very interesting experiment done in which they took rabbits and they shaved off a uh, part of their, the, the hair on their back. In the cage where they were, they had a lamp just above the cage, a, an ultraviolet lamp that shone with the same rays that caused skin cancer. Uh, the rabbits were given the usual kind of diet that people eat in our countries. I don't think it's that different here in England from what it is in U.S. and Canada. And uh, as the rabbits went through the experiment so many weeks, uh, sure enough, there were a number of cases of skin cancer. Uh, as I remember, it was 24% of the rabbits got skin cancer. They then repeated the experiment. And interesting results. They, uh, they made one change to that chow. It was the same chow, except they added vitamin C and vitamin E. How many cases of skin cancer did they get in these, in these rabbits? Zero. How many of you ever heard about diet being related to skin cancer? I hear a tremendous silence. I myself had never heard of it until I read this write-up. Diet affects most cancers, including skin cancer. Uh, in fact, they say that those that have studied into this, that perhaps 33% of the cancers that occur are due to the diet. And that's only what they know. They, it's not that easy to make the links to see cause and effect. It might be considerably more than that. Another 33% are due to tobacco. And then, something that most people don't think of with respect to cancer is alcohol. 11% uh, of cancers are due to alcohol. Well, if you add those up, you've got a figure of over three-fourths of cancers are due to how people live, not just something that happens willy-nilly. It's what they've, how they've been living in their life. Uh, the use of alcohol really increases the risk of esophageal cancer and a whole lot of other ones. Well, let's say the person already has cancer. We've talked a bit about causative factors, and right away those tell us things that we should be doing. Uh, by the way, re with respect to the vitamin C and the vitamin E, I'm not telling you to go out and start taking vitamin C and vitamin E pills. What foods have vitamin C? Many fruits do. Strawberries are high. They're even higher than oranges, I think, per weight. Oranges, of course, all the citrus fruits have it. 
one food seemed to be quite a bit ahead of the others. <laughs> Kiwi is better than oranges, but there's one that's ahead of all of those. And it is peppers, particularly red peppers. They don't have to be hot. You know, the sweet red peppers do it. They're just loaded with vitamin C. Vitamin E. Where do you get vitamin E? That was the other one that really helped against skin cancer. Vitamin E also is in lots of foods. Um, the ones with the highest vitamin E tend to be the nuts. And almonds are probably up at the top or near there. <clears throat> well, those that have cancer, when they hear it, it's like a death knell. Um, the usual treatments, what are they? Cut, burn, poison. And if you could do those things so that it only killed cancer cells, that'd be wonderful. You know, who wouldn't be against poisoning the cancer cells and nothing else? That'd be great. Uh, I can see the cutting. You know, getting out this big central mass of cancer. That central mass, which also becomes the, the source of spreading cancer. You know, the cells leaving it and going to other parts of the body. So, uh, it certainly makes sense to cut it out. Burning it with radiation. That's a little more touchy. Because you can't give a strong radiation treatment without affecting other cells in your body. And the ones that you worry about the most are the cells that are going to be your defense against cancer. What was that system? The immune system, the white blood cells. If you have that radiation spreading around much, it hurts the white blood cells. And finally, to poison the cancer, like we said, it'd be great if you could just do it to the cancer cells. But chemotherapy, the best that one can do is tune the chemotherapy so that it attacks cells like cancer cells are doing. They're reproducing rapidly. I mean, that's the characteristic of cancer. It's growing when, it sh when you shouldn't expect to have a lot of growing cells. Trouble is, there are other cells in our body that are being destroyed and replaced quickly so that there's a fair amount of multiplication in those cells. And any cell that multiplies rather rapidly is going to be damaged by chemotherapy. Uh, can we think of any cells that keep uh, producing, multiplying? Well, I'll tell you one group. Our digestive system is quite an amazing thing. It has in it the enzymes that tear apart proteins. And it's like a chainsaw that can, that can divide the bonds that make prote big protein molecules stick together. But we are protein. When I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, we're looking at protein. It's, just, it's got a nice shape, but it's protein. And the inside of us, the stomach wall is protein. Those enzymes in the stomach that tear apart proteins, every time you eat, you are damaging some of that stomach line. Now, the Lord has put in protective mechanisms, but nevertheless, there's quite a number of cells that are destroyed. So what has to happen? Those ones that are still competent have to divide and replace them. And that's why you should eat nothing for several hours between meals. It allows the stomach and the intestine to replace those damaged cells that were torn apart by the, pro the protein enzymes. So the digestive system has to keep not only working, but multiplying. What about when you take chemo? One of the main side effects, nausea. The person has no appetite. His digestive system isn't working. Uh, Actually, the worst of it is that one of the, uh, in fact, perhaps the main system that needs to keep multiplying. In fact, these soldiers in the white blood cell, they die on the battlefield. When you squeeze pus out of a wound, what you're seeing is mainly not bacteria, but dead white blood cells. Okay. Uh, so, 
All of that, that those white blood cells uh, are multiplying quickly and chemo is going to wreck them. And so you've lost the main weapon of your own that knows how to attack cancer cells and not destroy other cells. Well, our time is about up. When we talk with uh, patients that have cancer, uh, I never give them a guarantee because I can't. We pray together to the one who can guarantee. And the patient needs to realize it's only the Lord that can give the security and can heal it if it's his will. There's a verse that some people might take as a negative verse. I take it as a very positive verse. It's in Psalm 116, verse 15. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I think of it as God tenderly taking care of the, the person from babyhood all the way till his time to go to sleep. The Lord is taking care of the person all the way through, and when he goes to sleep to wait for the Lord's coming, there's the Lord taking care of him. Um, we also let, I let the person know, I could die before you, you do. None of us has tomorrow, for sure. Um, what we need to do is live today. Jesus told us, don't be worrying about tomorrow. Do all you can today and use God's gifts of healing. May the Lord bless you all, and uh, I hope you not only have assurance and faith, but you put into practice these things that can even prevent cancer.